Awesome to welcome University of North Dakota head coach Paul Sather to the basketball podcast. Armed with a collegiate coaching resume that includes 24 years and a head coaching record of 303 on 169, Sather has built a pair of national contending basketball teams at his two head coaching stops prior to North Dakota, Black Hills State and Northern State. Prior to that, he was a six-year assistant coach at Northern State, his alma mater, under legendary head coach Don Meyer. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. It's uh, I've been a, I've been a listener, so it's kind of fun to get a chance to sit down and talk some basketball with you. Well, absolutely, and uh, you know you're a basketball lifer. Your resume is uh, impressive, and uh, you've done it at multiple levels. But uh, let's start with Don Meyer. We got to hear some uh, some experiences and takeaways from being around Don Meyer for as long as you were. Yeah, you know, I was I was fortunate to work with him for five years. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't play for him. Uh, you know, he coached at Northern, and I played at Northern. But I would have played for Bob Olson. And when Coach Olson took the AD position, I was his assistant coach. He had hired me back, um, and uh, and then that's when Coach Meyer came in. So I'd been with Coach Olson for one year as the full time, and then I came in. Uh, and then Coach Meyer came in. I was with him for five years, and you know, uh, both of them in my in my eyes, like when you when you get a chance to work with a guy like Bob Olson, uh, who is a small college legend in my eyes. He got out of coaching early simply because of an AD position that was available at his school at Northern State. And then he hired Coach Meyer, who, you know, back in the day when I was a player, we did a lot of post post development that was Don Meyer uh, with Coach Olson. We did perimeter development that was a lot of Don Meyer terminology. I had tapes, and I told Coach this. I had tapes that I had dubbed um, that, that we had bought there at Northern State that I had dubbed because I wanted to coach, and, and I wanted to take these tapes, and I was poor. So I, I dubbed <laughs> those tapes. And I told Coach Meyer, I've got some dubbed tapes of yours. I I stole them basically. Um, and, and so like, he's been a part of my life well before I, he even, I even worked with him. I, I was his mom's, I lived in his mom's basement in Wayne, America when I was Greg McDermott's GA. And I didn't know that until I was moving in and his mom gave me a, a file folder of his handouts, just like he would have done. Like he, he had her taught well, like here, here's my son, <laughs> here's my son's file folder. And I said, you're Don Meyer's mom. I've got like videotapes. I, I dubbed in my box here. I'm moving. So just the connections that were going on before that and then getting a chance to work with them. Um, phenomenal. And, and, and just, you, you know, the, there's so many things that you think of every day that he is just in your ear on still um, so many things that happen, um, whether it's teaching or whether it's keeping young people accountable or whether it's just sitting in a room by yourself and, and you're trying to work through, Hey, what's the next step with this team that you've got? Uh, he's always constantly a, a voice, you know, he's our Obi-Wan Kenobi when it comes to, you know, he he's always there and has a voice to, to what our program is doing and, and how we've got to improve. So, you know, constant learner, you love learning, you love talking and asking questions of other people. People would call and ask him questions. And by the time they knew it, he had picked their brain a lot more than they picked his. And he was a master at that. And, and uh, an awesome person to work with, treated his staff so well, um, had a lot of fun. I, I, I tell people, one of the things I miss most about Coach is his laugh was he had an incredible, just big old heavy gut laugh when he got laughing. And uh, those are the things you kind of miss. Um, I, can, I can read his stuff and I, can all the, I got all those things. Uh, I, I just miss the, the, the kind of person he was and the, the friend that he was and the mentor that he, that he was, but uh, he still manages to, to fill a lot of those boxes for, for a lot of people, uh, even, even though he's passed on. Yeah. Myself included. I mean, uh, so many of the things that he shared that uh, resonate with me and I had a chance to meet him when he came, did a clinic at the university of Windsor. And I went down to one of his academies and just those small times I was around him, just yeah. such a big influence. And I, you know, I feel for young people that I haven't had a chance, but you can still go online and find most of his stuff. Yeah. I don't. Oh, coach, do you have a favorite quote that still resonates with you? you can share well, with? you know, it, I don't know if I've got one favorite one. You know, just the other day I was talking about, you know, you know, and I don't know. I think he stole a lot of things. Like I know he did. Um, but you know, we talked a lot about. We talk a lot about it's okay to make mistakes and you know recognize, admit, learn, forget. And then that was from Coach Meyer. You know, just just having that. But but uh, no, I I, I just. Uh, there's so many different things from coach. I don't know if I have just yeah. one, 
Well, he's one of the um, best sharers, obviously, in the history yeah, of basketball. Incredible. And he helped us, he helped us connect with so many other coaches because of the sharing. You say yeah. stole, but I mean he the Chuck Dalyisms, all the different things that I heard the first time from coach at clinics and everything else. And one of the ones I'll share one quickly with everyone, and that's administrators are like pigs. Don't wrestle with a pig because yeah. you both get dirty and the pig and the likes pigs love it. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how yeah. often I referred to that in my mind when I was about to get into a discussion with an administrator. And it just made me pause and think about what that conversation was going to be like. <laughs> when when I think of them, when I when I talk to younger coaches or people that are maybe going to be head coaches for the first time, you know, that old, uh, you know, and I, and I screw this up a lot because the, the English shot, it's bad, but he'd always say, you know, be who you are. Cause if you ain't who you is, you ain't, you, you, you know, whatever, however that went. Right. I, and I screw this up every time, but I, I think of that a lot because I think anytime you become a head coach for the first time, you're really trying to find your identity. Um, and, and when I was at, at Black Hill state for the first month as a head coach, I, I tried to be coach Meyer. Um, and, and that was the worst existence of my life. I couldn't do it. And, and I, I wasn't going to be up for that. I, you you got to kind of find who you are and be true to yourself. And, and I think that was something that, again, echoed in my ears from Coach Meyer as far as um, everybody's got a little different. There's a million different ways to do things. And you got to do truly kind of find out how you're going to do it and, uh, and how you're going to run a program and the expectations and, and those kind of things. So that's what goes through my mind an awful lot, especially as you, as you take over a new program. Well, and now you're doing it and you've done it for a long yeah. time and, uh, you know, great success at uh, Black Hill State and IA and then at Northern State Division two and now at uh, North Dakota. So I'm just curious with all those different levels, what are some of your takeaways from having coached at the different levels and how that's helped support you now as a coach at the Division one level? Yeah, you know, I think NAI and Division two, the, the level was pretty, you know, whether you're at Black Hill State or you're at Oklahoma Wesleyan, I think the level was pretty similar, right? You didn't have power fives. You didn't have those kind of things. I think you make the move to division two and a, a, a league like the Northern sun, um, I, it, it was such a good league. Uh, it is such a good league. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you, you, you could argue that a lot of the division two teams in that Northern sun are, are similar to what a low major, low major basketball program would be like. I mean, we, we had taken a Northern state team to Butler and, and won at Butler in an exhibition game. We, we took a good Northern state team to Arizona state with Bobby Hurley's team. And we lost in double overtime um, and, and other teams in our league. I think it was Augustana went and won at Iowa in a, in a scrimmage or something. There's just examples of that across the board in division two. So I, I think when you talk about level of basketball, um, there's a high end of division two. There's a lot of similarities to, to that low mid major level of division one. Um, and, and especially with some of these Midwest conferences, I feel the MIAA, the Northern sun, the GLIAC, some of those just tremendous, tremendous coaches and leagues. And, and um, so I, I think the jump to the summit league was, there was some things that, we were really familiar with the summit league. We had scrimmaged some of the teams in it. I knew some of the coaches in it. Um, and, and there's a lot of familiar recruiting faces in the, in the summit league of kids that we recruited that we, in, you know, ended up going to a division one level while I was at Northern state. And, and so there was some familiarity there for us. Um, the difference is a little bit, the extreme from that low to mid major to some of the power fives is a little bit more extreme. Um, the money aspect of that stuff is different. Uh, and, and, and so, but like within our league, I, you know, I think it's a really, really good league. Uh, it's a really well coached league in the summit league. Uh, it reminds me of the Northern sun of the MIAA. It's just, you know, a little bit bigger, a little bit longer, a little bit stronger, a little bit faster. Uh, but Ben McCollum's Northwest Missouri state teams would, would do pretty well. Uh, I, I well like my Northern state team would, would now would they, would, would, I'm not saying any of them would win a league or anything like that. I just think that they're very well coached, very good teams with very good players on it. And, and uh, that's obviously what we're trying to build here. We're, you know, we're trying to build a, in the past years where I've been, you, you build a program um, by recruiting quality young people, adding young people, maybe it's transfers um, that, that really want to buy in and be something bigger than themselves. And, and you build it and it takes a little bit of time. Sometimes it speeds up. Sometimes it, 
but but it does take time. I, I think that that little hiccup here is the, the the portal and some of those things that have taken place. You know, we've we've been hit by some of that. So right now, you know, this coming year, we we got eight returning guys and we're getting healthy and we got a really good young recruiting class that I'm really excited about. And I, I think we can really take a step. But I, I think any coach would tell you. I mean, consistency goes a long, long ways. And, and in order to get consistency, you need to have some people uh, around for, for multiple years and, and uh, especially having a base of those guys around multiple years. And that's what we're trying to build here again and, and getting it going. So every single year, we're a team that can compete for a summer league championship. Well, no doubt. And you've done it at other places. So it's a matter of time. I have no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, let's get into the heart of some of your philosophy and some of the different things uh, that uh, that you coach. And uh, one of them that stood out to me was this concept of heart touches. And it's mainly the phrasing of that. But can, can you explain heart touches to us? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Coach Wicks, so Sundance Wicks was on our staff at Northern State. And uh, he had worked with Rex Walters, who at that time was working up with Stan Van Gundy with the, with the Pistons. And that was something we pulled from the Pistons. And it was, you know, you always talk about, hey, we want to get this many paint touches. and But we really felt like this was a little bit more of a general, easier way to just say, hey, heart touches. We, we kind of would we'd put a rectangle of, of outside the lane, but in that, in that kind of the heart of the, the paint area. And then we would we would measure every time you drive to that spot and, and and we would score. You know, you might drive and score. You might drive and kick. Uh, you might drive and then dump it to the post. But the key was we wanted to drive for a heart touch or a post touch into the heart for a heart touch or a back cut or some, you know, a curl cut, something that brings it to the heart. And then we would we will keep track of our heart touch possessions and our non heart touch possessions. And it was one of the most profound, it was one of the most profound statistics we kept. We used to keep a lot of different things. And we started just really keeping a little more simple on offense with heart touches. And, you know, the, the more touches we got, the higher our field goal percentage was. And it was very rare. There, there's a very few times I could probably count on one hand where I think we lost to Wayne state one time and Wayne, had an incredible amount of non-heart touches that they scored on. But uh, outside of that, most times it plays out pretty similar that if you're getting a high level of heart touches and you're finishing those, um, you're going to really put yourself in a position. And then, you know, on the defensive side of it, you counter that. You want to keep teams out of the heart. You want to you want to do those things the best you can. And 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 so, but that, that, that was the concept. We would keep track of every possession and did that possession see a heart touch. And it would be a post touch, a drive, a back cut. We even counted an offensive rebound as a heart touch uh, if they got it in the heart. And uh, and then we would keep track of our shooting percentage in the heart and our shooting percentage when we didn't get a heart touch. And usually there was a huge discrepancy in non heart touch shots uh, instead of the heart touch shots. And so that that when when the team sees that kind of data, it is amazing. They have a little more sense of urgency and purpose to how they play. And uh, so we want to, you know, we want to try to give that, that information as much as we can. Yeah. And that information, I love that you connected to both sides of the ball, because usually, again, when you're talking about offense, the counter is what the same thing on defense in just a different way. And uh, I think you talked about the goal. Is it 75%? Is that the heart touch goal? Yeah. On offense? Yeah. Ultimately that would be a really good percentage to get. And, and, you know, like you want them, you know, it'd be nice to say you're going to get it every single possession. But you also need your players playing with some instinct and some feel. And there's some open rhythm threes, maybe in transition we might have, or some some plays that might happen that are in a rhythm or some guys kind of cooking. Um, so so it isn't a hundred percent, but I, you know, 75% is a good goal for us to to get to that point. But that includes a, a penetration into the heart and then a kick out to an open three. Would that be yep. part of that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. It's not just ball, shots in the heart area. Yeah, it, no, it is not. It is. It is. Anytime the ball, like, like, like we work on, we work on a back cut, like maybe it's a baseline back cut where you might get a catch on that back cut. And then you're hitting the drift guy uh, in the opposite corner because the defense is going to still suck in on that. So we'll work on that cut with that catch and being able to still stop with as a defense collapse and then find a corner. Uh, or, or find a crack back, you know, find something where we're still getting into three. So a big part of it to me is making open threes. 
And an offensive rebound kick out three is a great way to get an open three too. So all those would count as a, as a hard touch. Awesome. And uh, you mentioned goal kind of 75% on offense. What would be the goal defensively then for you to limit them? Yeah. You know, I don't, that's a great question. We, we never really said, we've never really set a goal on that. Um, I think we've done probably more just to talk about it, but we've never really set a goal and that's probably a good, a good way to look at it. I, I, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to keep a team even below a 50%, uh, you know, honestly, but that would be a heck of a goal if you, if your goal is 75 and you're keeping it about 50%, but you know, we've never, we've never kept it on the defensive side of it. We keep track of our opponents, um, but we don't uh, we don't necessarily set goals for our defensive side of it. But it's one for us to maybe look into a little bit more. I love it. It's a great concept and it's a cool way to be able to explain it and connect it to your players. And that's a part of it. And uh, you already referenced Don Meyer and post play and different things like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But let, before we do, I mean, talk to us about bad feet, bad player and how you coach feet. Because, that, again, that and when I hear Coach Meyer in my mind, I reference yeah. back to so much of the detail around footwork. Yeah. Footwork, you know, it is, and it's balance and it's, it's, it's fine in your base and it's lower. You know, it's coach would always say you want to play low, but you can't play too low. Like you got to find that spot that works for you to move and have balance and play at a high rate of speed without losing balance. And, 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 and so like, you know, you know, whether you're permanent pivot foot, we used to really be a permanent pivot foot team on offense. Um, so we'd work a lot. If you're a right-handed player, we'd really work a lot on your left pivots, front pivots, left, you know, left rear turns, a lot of jabs, all those kind of things to really develop that. Um, I, I have changed. I, 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 you know, I've, I've got to the point now where I think kids put a lot of work in stuff and, and, and you know, we, we really allow kids to use both pivot feet, but we still want them to establish some footwork for them. You know, we a lot of the Phil Beckner footwork series stuff he does, we implement in our practice um, almost daily. Uh, uh, we got to be careful because sometimes guys, I always tell our guys, you know, listen, this is a high level NBA trainer that that works with NBA guys. And I, I think I think you understand you, you feel like this is easy footwork stuff. But if you do it at the rate of speed that we want you to, you know, in the stance that we want you to, it'll wear you out. And it'll really help you with your balance aspect of stuff. So, like, yeah, we'll, we'll work a ton on just catches, getting, you know, getting your feet set and really being efficient with your steps, you know, being efficient with your jabs, not taking extra steps into your shot, not taking extra steps defensively. You know, I, everything you're doing, it's the old economy of motion. You know, again, Coach Meyer talk, but it's using your footwork to be as efficient as, as it can possibly become to help you be the best athlete you can be. And I've seen really good offensive and defensive players that are very average athletes, but because their footwork is so good, like they're hard, they're impossible to stay in front of, or, or there are guys on defense that do an incredible job of just staying in front of guys that are quicker than them because they're so efficient. And, and so, you know, working at a high level reps and working, working, you know, really building your footwork, I think is important. And uh, whether you're an inside step, on, on, on catches or, or your feet in the air, ball in the air, feet in the air on catches. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. I think it's really establishing what you want as a program and then making sure you're holding your guys accountable to, to how you want them to do it. Well, I love already that you referenced that there's not necessarily one perfect way. And I do feel like that's part of modern coaching is to adapt a little bit to the players. Because I can remember so many times at clinics, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, sitting around and everyone debating what footwork was best. But don't you find nowadays less players are turning to shoot as opposed to stepping in to shoot because of the emphasis, as you said, on you know this, this getting to the paint and kick out threes rather than coming off of screens and shooting? Yeah. You know, I played with probably one of the best college basketball shooters in the history uh, in, in Eric Klein. And I think anybody at any level that saw him play would agree with me. Uh, he played NAIA basketball, but but was an inside step, inside pivot on his catch and his shot and was phenomenal. Um, as as I've moved on, I definitely like ball in the air, feet in the air. I think I think getting yourself shot ready on catches is the best way. Um, but I, I do feel there's certain guys and there's certain people that are just, you know, maybe they practice it one way so much or, or if for whatever reason, their comfort level, I think you have to be somewhat flexible. And if they have a way of doing it, then, then you've got to really pay attention to that if they're successful. But some of these guys, they don't have a clue. 
And every time it's different. And if you can help now guide them into a, into a more consistent repetition, as far as, Hey, this is how your footwork, you know, maybe give them some opportunities to try some things, but you know, I think you do need to build something with some of these young people that don't have good footwork. Let's try to get some consistency. Cause I do think it'll help not just their shooting, but their ability to attack and the ability to be shot ready on catches and attack defenses that are closing out on them with balance um, and, and having a little bit higher level of performance with, with their ability to attack. So it's tricky. I, you know, I, I, it's definitely something I've opened up to more. I was pretty rigid on my permanent pivot foot stuff, not, you know, probably four or five years ago. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I do agree with you. A base helps them be more adaptable ultimately and develop what uh, Alex Ram and I share is this differential learning, these degrees of freedom, but it all comes from this base. So uh, it's great, whatever footwork you have that helps you get better. And of course, you're referencing a little bit playing in the post and different things like that through the things we've talked about. Do you feel that nowadays for you as a collegiate coach, it's more about you developing a post player than recruiting a post player because of how players are playing the game a little bit more positionless. Yeah. And, and, you know, the old traditional kind of back to the basket posts are, are harder to find and I was gonna say. even harder to develop, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, the mundanity of working on your jump hooks and your footwork. I think kids that are bigger are growing up and they're doing a lot more skilled facing the basket stuff. So, you know, for us and even here at North Dakota, it's been a change because where I was, we were pretty fortunate to have some air, aircraft carriers in the post that, that were big and strong and physical and really bought into being back to the basket. Um, my first few years here, we had a Philip Rebracha, who's now in Iowa. And Philip, uh, Philip was a guy that could score back to the basket, but also could face the basket pretty well. But his percentages with his back to the basket were really, really good. And and, you know, I, I'd say from his first year to his second year with us, we tried to progress him a little bit more, giving him some more freedom facing the basket some. And, and the one, the current post we have right now, we've got a couple guys that are more probably stretch five type guys. Um, and then I've got one freshman that's a little bit more of that true back to the basket post. Well, now he's a sophomore, but, but so it is, it, it is developing them. And it's developing, again, footwork and getting to your spots, keeping it simple. Um, you don't have to have a million moves. We, we really believe in getting your work done before you get a catch. And so we work a lot in timing of, of a, you know, timing your duck in, as we call it, you know, as the ball moves, maybe you're kind of waiting for that ball to find you and you're trying to set your defender up at a disadvantage by stepping into them, owning that position. And as the ball now swings around, you, you can kind of seal and hold that angle to the basket and get your work done before you get to catch. And, you know, again, a lot of that goes back to some old Lipscomb film and some old Lipscomb tape about sealing and, and really being great at balance and footwork and catches and finishes. And, and we had some high level, high 60% field goal guys while I was at Northern. Philip, my first year here was like a six, I think he was a 60% field goal guy. As we moved him out, his field goal percentage went down, but it's, it's because he took more threes uh, than what he had the year before. But but uh, I, I really feel like if you do it right, you don't have to be the biggest guy, but if you can learn how to use that body, if you can develop both hands and finish either, with either hand pretty well and take some contact, you can have good success down there. And you know, that's what we're, we're working on building some more of that here. Well, and of course, I know you, you get what you emphasize to a certain extent. It's not about the post player. It's about the passers, isn't it? And their ability to be able to get the ball inside. And as you said, with timing. And are there different things that you do within your motion concepts to be able to emphasize it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the old every catch you're looking, you know, rim post and action, you know. So we're really trying to get them to emphasize how they catch it, the perimeter, how they catch it. Be shot ready. First and foremost, be ready to shoot. And then as you're, you know, as you're feeling if that shot's there or not, the next look you have is into the post. And then it's, then it's getting the ball to the post in a, in a place where he can make a play. Um, so maybe it's taking one dribble over. You know, if you're on the left side, maybe it's taking one dribble down to the baseline uh, to get a left-handed feed in for a baseline feed. It's, it's learning to read and pass away from the defense and then, you know, giving them a pass that's catchable, not, not taking them out of their position. Uh, or, or passing it back into where their defense is. So, you know, there's reps of that. There's, there's just a lot of, 
you know, three and O reps where maybe you're working on a screening action and where a guy curl cuts and then the screener comes back to the ball, the post now ducks in and he takes one dribble down into a, into a post feed. You, you know, we, we would, we work on those kind of things quite a bit just to work on the skill because it is a skill passing it top downs are a skill with some pass fakes. Um, and any kind of wing entry pass into the post can be hard just because that defense can really be loaded and, and it can be difficult to get them in there in a position to, to get a catch. And, and so it's something you got to really work on and, and, and have a good idea and skill base on what you want from your players. Uh, it's such a great point because, I mean, we, we often condemn players for not being post players anymore, but truly it comes back to guards aren't post feeders anymore or perimeter players aren't post feeders anymore, which is why would I post up if I'm never going to get the ball or never going to get the pass type of the situation. Yeah, and every there's a lot of teams now that post up a lot of different guys. And, and what you see a lot now is catches that are getting, you know, seven, eight feet, nine feet off the block, and now they're just backing people down. Um, which, you know, that, that works too. There's just, like I said, there's a million ways of doing it. The do you, do you allow for that within your offense? The T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-
Coach, we'll transition a little bit to some terminology because I got to say, one of the things that you shared with me is your your defensive terminology sheet. And I'm like, this is this is amazing. This is like us as coaches love this stuff, don't we? Yeah, I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Phrasing and acronyms and all the different stuff and just a system of talk, as you say. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe first just talk about this and talk about where some of these terms have come from. Oh, they've come from just, you know, everybody from, from you know, Coach Olson to Coach – Meyer to coach miles, you know, guy like coach miles, who was my coach and, and worked with coach Olson, who I've, I've stayed in great touch with, but, but then just the, the assistant coaches that I've worked with, you know, Justin wick, who's up at, up at Duluth right now and doing an awesome job at Duluth brought the terminology whip, you know, and he, he worked with, uh, with the guys from Butler that were at Iowa at some time when he was there as the film guy. And, and so like just a term like whip, you know, where, where you're going to go under, where, you know, if you're going to whip under a ball screen, if you're going to whip a, a pin down screen, you know, that's just one example, but like, there's just so many things you learn from the people that you work with uh, and, and that you learn from people that maybe you don't know at all, but, but, but you watch and see and, and, and you take stuff. And, you know, it's, a, it, I think anytime as a coach, you, you always keep an open mind. Um, because someone you might hear 10 things and one of those things might be ideal for your program if you can somehow make it work for what you're doing the other nine may not work but if if you get one idea from somebody to help your program improve you know be open to that and you know i, I try to be sometimes it's hard to be but but you definitely want to try to be and, and i think a lot of the stuff we do is is you know, there's just some, you know, Matt Severide was an assistant of mine that I thought was a really good defensive coach. He's out of coaching now, but that's a guy that to me, I just, I've got a ton of respect for him and his mind and, and, and defensively, you know, the, the different ideas that he brought. So yeah, everybody you work with, I think has a chance to have an influence in your program. It's great. And then uh, as coaches, I mean, it's, I don't think it's unique to us, but we certainly love terminology and phrasing. And I feel like that's what a lot of people have taken from the podcast is just some different ways to be able to say some things. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go through some of these. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, S-V-P-T-A-M. That's a long yeah. one, but uh, yeah. share it with us. Coach. Well, that's that's an old Coach Meyer one. That stands yeah. vision, position, talk, anticipate, move, you know, and that's that's it's it's kind of one of those things I could put on a sheet. And I, I could put it on a board with our guys or, or, or a pregame where our guys understand, that, that, you know, because it all starts with a stance, you know, it all starts with your stance and then your vision and then your position and your position's always, the ball moves, you move, your man moves, you move. If both are moving, you better be ready. Right. And so your stance, vision, position, you got to really stay with then, then when you have those things, you're talking and you're anticipating because now as soon as somebody's ready to make a skip pass, you got to anticipate there because you got to be there on a catch because that's a long closeout. And, and so you got to be ready to move. So it's just to me, it kind of encompasses your defense and, and all the things in a very simple little phrase that are really, really important in everything you do. And it's funny, we're talking about this with our staff the other day. We're talking about our gap. We're talking about overhelping. And when it boils down to it, the biggest problem we have right now is we got to do a better job guarding the basketball. And a lot of times I think you find when your gap defense isn't very good, you're probably not guarding the ball very well. And when your help side's late, a lot of times you're not guarding the ball well enough. And so I think we can get lost in other things, but at the end of the day, keeping it really simple, are we guarding the ball? How's our stance? You know, and my gap, how's our vision, you know, and my help side, how's my awareness. And, and, and so I just, that's a phrase that we use to, I, I write it down a lot. And it just keeps me aware and keeps our staff and our players aware of kind of defensively what the important things for us. You know, and talking about the gap defender, one of your terms is rake. So can you explain that? Yeah, rake is, is uh, and, and again, I've heard it from a lot of different people. It, it's just when you're in the gap, and especially if you're guarding someone that's maybe not a great shooter, um, but if you're in the gap and you're not moving to the gap and there's penetration, you know, just to kind of really use that hand to kind of rake at the ball, just to, just to rake at the ball. We'll do it with our posts. Well, if, if, if there's a post feed or if there's somebody on top and you can, you know, you can be two places at once. So that would be um, on a dig situation that a you're dig raking. situation. You can rake a little bit there as well. You know, we, so yeah, the, the, it's, it's uh, again, this sheet, there's probably different words we might emphasize more and more. 
Yeah. Um, but, but cause we are more of a veer team. Like, so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely veer more in the gap to our shooter. Then, then we will stay and rake the ball really hard. But if you're in position really well, you can do both. And that's the, ultimately that's the goal. So by veer in this sense, you're talking about being early in the gap help, but you're recovering to your shooter. Early in the gap help to kind of take yeah. away that. To, yeah. So now that, and, and again, it starts with guarding the ball. If they can, if they can guard the, their yard, so to speak, um, and, and push into the gaps, you've got to be ready in my, you've got to be ready to now. Our league's a really good three-point shooting league. So we've got to be a good gap to ball team, gap to a closeout team. And, and so it's important to be in the gap because you got to have that presence. Uh, but you also got to be ready to close out because if you get stuck over helping, um, you're giving up threes. And, and that's something we don't want to we don't want to do. Uh, a Leo obviously emphasizes communication. You explain that, but more so, how do you develop that? Because I think that's a common question from coaches: is how do you get your team to talk? Yeah, more? that's a great question. I you just I think more and more in anything, you just got to be make them accountable and make them talk in everything they're doing. You know, make them talk when they're doing passing drills. Make them talk when they're calling out screens. Try to get them talking, and and you know what? It's uncomfortable for young people. And, and, uh, but it's something I think you just got to keep them accountable on as much as you can every single day. And eventually it starts taking place, but it's, I don't know if you got something that happens where the light switch can turn on quicker, let me know (laughs) because some players are really good at it and others just really struggle at it. And it's kind of being that loud early and off in that talk. And, you know, there's four words and I, and I put it up there. There's four words that we're really trying to emphasize this summer. And now this, fall and that's loud disruptive you know loud physical disruptive and closing type mentalities on both sides of the floor play loud play physical play disruptive and be a closer and and those four words like we've been yelling those four words at every workout and it's trying to get them to bring out a little bit more of that alpha male to them uh in a little less kind of that timid quiet way and i don't know Hold them accountable. That's the best way. Don't don't let it be where they're quiet. You know, make 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 them have consequences for being quiet. And the closer part is is finishing the play, whether it's on offense or defense. Yeah, on, on defense, it's yeah. do, guys doing their job. It's from the yeah. shot contest to to the blockouts to two handed rebounds. It's closing the possession the right way, um, and having that mentality of closing it the right way. And on offense, it's closing it by getting a great shot. You know, it's getting the shots you want. And sometimes it doesn't go in. But ultimately, if you if you get the shots you want, um, more often than not, you're going to be happy with that possession. And I know you have low eye and high eye on, high eye on here, and you reference three-point shooting in your league. That seems to be something that's changed a little bit with basketball in the sense that, you know, it used to be you're in a line in an eye. But nowadays, really an eye doesn't work, right? Because you usually have one in and one out rather than more of an eye. Yeah. Yeah. And our low eyes probably a little bit more closer to the ball and the highs a little bit more man side. Um, and just with, with way offenses are right now, you are a little more spaced out than that anyhow. Um, but we still identify those because a lot, a lot of it is who's our tag guy or who's our, like on a, on a, on a ball screen, let's say a lot of times our low eye might be the tag guy uh, in a lot of cases, uh, the guy that's furthest away might have those tag responsibilities. Whereas if the guy picking pops, that high eye might be the guy that either rotates or, or swipes at the, the pop guy. So it allows his man to recover. So like the, we identify him as low eyed high, just to kind of simplify who the tag guy is in certain situations. Plus you've got the old baseline low eye help fill. And then the, the cover down recovery from the high, from the high eye. So just different ways to kind of identify the placement of players and, and what their roles are, I guess. Yeah, it's great stuff. And uh, uh, Max Lafarve from the Timberwolves was on talking about verticality, and that's more of the NBA way of defending the rim by being able to jump in the air and stay vertical. But at the college level, it's more what we call wallops, right? So yeah. can you explain wallops and maybe how you develop and teach those? Yeah, I, again, I think it's repetition and it's, it's, it's teaching kids. A lot of times it's pretty uncomfortable to take that contact. So guys turn or they, or they really bring their arms down. They, they, I think the biggest thing you notice with – with, with our players is um, 
first and foremost, they don't want to take any, any kind of hits to their chest. So like on defense now, like we really try to talk and coach horseman said this last year. And I love that. He just said, play with a heavy chest. Mm -hmm. So when you're guarding the basketball, eventually you got to stand your ground and you can't, you can't just, eventually you got to stand your ground. So in the post on a wall up, it's a similar deal where, where you got to go straight up and no matter how much contact's coming your way, you need to stay vertical because the minute you bring your arms down a little bit with that contact, um, it's a foul. Officials and, love that call. And, and, well, and, and listen, I, I, I just, yeah. I, I think basketball has put officials in a very difficult spot the way they have to ref it now. Mm -hmm. There's so many judgment calls and yeah, if their arms come down, it doesn't matter if you get hit in the gut as hard as you can, you got to keep those hands up. Otherwise it's a, it's a, it's a foul. So, you know, obviously we, the wall up part of it's important and be physical with your wall ups. And then, you know, the gang rebound aspect of it, it's hard to be a wall up guy and get the rebound. So don't sit and watch the guy wall up, be ready to come and help rebound the ball and, and be a gang rebound guy. Yep. That's a great point. Great point. Great connection to that. And then the other part about wall ups now is obviously you talked about be closers defensively, like closing a drive, Usually, if you play good defense, as you said, guard your yard, and that could possibly end up in a wall-up situation as well in trying to close that play, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, it, you got to find a way to rim protect. And I think, you know, sometimes if you don't have the 6'11", long, lanky, shot-blocking guy, wall-up, you know, just having somebody that can really provide physica physicality and wall-ups uh, against guys that are trying to finish can really be effective. And we don't probably have a, a shot blocker per se, but I, you know, we're trying to develop some of the wall up guys and be better at that, but everybody's got to be ready to do it. Well, this is your version of rim protection. And uh, we, we call them no open windows, but I think you call it no angles where you're trying to force the finish over you rather than allowing them to get through you on a step through or different things like that. Is that, is that what I'm gathering? Yeah. From yeah. Similar. Right. Right. I, I, you know, I think absolutely, you know, I, I probably talk a lot about no angles in the post, whereas make the post man finish over you, you know, you talked about analytics and not always fronting, but you, you you're making a post finish over the top. And, and, and again, sometimes you, you put yourself in a bad position where you give up at that angle and now they get to their spot and now that shot gets better. So as, as much as you can, whether it's a wall up or, or guard in the post, really developing that mindset of staying between your man and the basket. Another defensive term that I use still too, it, pistols, right, is that <laughs> ability to be able to see both. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about that anymore as much as it is about being a head turner because the game just moves so much faster, doesn't it? It, it does. And there is going to be your head on a swivel a lot. Um, but, but just having that awareness, having the awareness and just, especially in that help side position where you can see the whole floor. Um, you know, I think about bigs a lot where, you know, maybe you're guarding the big that's opposite short corner and, and just really opening your body up and seeing everything and really talking, you know, be the anchor of your defense and really talking and, and, and anything on help side where you can be kind of just in that pistol stance where you're seeing your man and seeing your ball. So old, old, there's no doubt that's some that's been used. I think Gene Hackman used that in Hoosiers. <laughs> so that's been around a while, but oh, of course it, it is. It is. It's just, you want to know what it means. A lot of these kids may not know what it means. Right. And, and JTB jumped to the ball. I mean, it's still such a challenge for players, isn't it? I, I found oh. that. At the college level, that was one of the things that I had the hardest time getting newcomers to be able to do is something that we think is very obvious. And it's amazing when they do it, how much it helps the team defense, but how much it helps their defense. You get screened less. You know, you're, you're in a better position. Your footwork's better, you know, and, and the old jump back to the basket bit. It's just in today's offense. I think it really shreds you. So like, I just, uh, yeah, that's jump it to the ball is guard the basketball and jump it to the ball. Those two things are, are very, very difficult to build habits on. Yeah. And guarding the ball is obviously that's an individual skill to a certain extent, but you know, having people jump to the ball creates that perception that the offensive player has less space and that helps the player guard the ball. So they go yeah. together, don't they? Yeah, they sure do. Yeah. Anything you can do to kind of shrink that floor make that ball feel like there's just less room to work. You, you, you're doing your job. Yep. When you talk about KYP, know your personnel, how many different players do you define in your scout? Is it like a shooter driver and non-shooter, or do you have more to it than that? 
Yeah, for the most part, it's it's just that. For the most part, there's going to be guys that are players, you know, like a Kobe, mm. right? Um, and, and and we're going to go a little bit more NBA name term. We haven't in the past. We've, we've said more like he's a 50-50 guy. That means he can shoot it and he can drive it. Uh, or he's a dead three where you got to run him off the line. Or he's a straight-up driver uh, where, where you close out a little bit short. So – and in rotations, you're going to be guarding different players. So it's really important. It's amazing how important that light closeout is when you're in a rotation mode and all of a sudden you need to get a stop and your big guys run it out to a driver on a rotation and he just gives them a wide open you know, layup because he had the wrong closeout. So it's knowing your personnel and, and understanding what hand, you know, if you can, if you can have an idea of, how they shoot it, you know, what your goals are for them as far as keeping them off the line or, or not allowing them to the heart on drives. Um, you can, you can take away guys uh, throughout the game that way. And, you know, I think a, a lot of teams, I think do a pretty good job with the personnel aspect of it. And we, we've got to do a better job. Like we've got to carry over one through five. We got to carry over the, the player personnel aspect of scouting better. And so we're going to, we're going to change it. We're going to do the Rondo, Corver, Kobe. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more, everybody, a lot of people do that. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, those names are pretty Except familiar. for none of them are in the league anymore. So No, they're not. They're not. It's, Rondo's not in the league either. Huh? Yeah. Oh, um, he might be. Maybe he picked, picked up somewhere. Yeah, I'm not I, sure. It yeah. seems like he might be, but, but Played yeah. <laughs> but, but they are guys, I think, that really defined yep. those positions really, really well. Um, and, uh, but. I know I was, we were trying to think besides Corver right now, who would we put in there? Um, and, and Corver to me was still the best example of that. So I know, we, I think he's doing TV now, so he can, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there's some highlights up there. It's great. And then the opposite of a dead three, you used to call a dork. We all had a term like yeah. that. That's yeah, a non-shooter, non-player. Yeah. And, and again, that's just, um, a lot of that might just be, hey, it, it, you got to know how you're going to maybe lose the game. Mm. in a sense right like like there's times where it's just like you know what we could do all we wanted to try to guard this guy we're not going to be able to if we're shutting down like for instance we played Oral roberts and they had a smiths and they had a banner they also had a really good four or five that they played um and at the end of the day we kind of chose if if somebody's going to have to beat us it's not going to be old banner and it's not going to be a smith it's going to be this other guy right and well, that other guy got us, but he didn't get us every time. Like we had some luck guarding those guys simply because we couldn't guard everybody because they were really, really talented that way. But if we could take away their two best and we're making someone else beat us. So the dork rule comes in, maybe the kid can't shoot at all. Coach Meyer used to say, you know, the principal's kid, you know, they got to put him on the floor, even though he can't shoot, don't guard him. Yeah. Right. Well, you don't, we don't use it as much at this level. Uh, even in the Northern sun, we didn't use it much. When I was at NAI, I felt like we could use it more. Um, I think in high school, you can use it a ton. And I, I remember in, in, when, I, when I was at Black Hill State, we played a really good Jamestown team and their point guard wasn't a great shooter. And they had a, they had a couple great guys that could drive you and shoot it. And they had a really good post. And our dork guy did an awesome job of helping in the post and plugging up the holes all the while. And, and we had a really good record against those guys. They were good. Now, we didn't beat them every time. But the last time, I think, with that kid as a dork on their team, he made like four threes that game. And they ended up beating us. But, like, it worked for a long period of time. So I think there's different ways to utilize it but it doesn't always work out the way you want it to. <laughs> no, it definitely doesn't always work out. I, and yeah. from experience, I know, but those are also coach clap moments where you're clapping yeah. for your defense yeah. despite the outcome because they're doing what you wanted them to scout do. Scout stops. That's yeah. right. And, and we call them scout stops. Like okay. when, when somebody does their job and gets a scout stop, even, even if the kid makes the difficult shot, okay, hey, you did your job. Love that. And, 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 and if we got to adjust, we got to adjust. But let's, let's make them maybe have to make two of those or three of those before we just – rush to a, a a change so yeah different adjustments love that terminology uh what's a terminator that that's like your last your last second play right your late clock play you know whether it's a high ball screen and it's i think it's important knowing what your opponent's terminators are you know it, it's an important um you know what's ours you know late clock 
I don't, we, with motion, a lot of times we like running motion all the way through. And I, what you tell them at that point is be more inside 10 seconds, just be more aggressive, be more aggressive with your, with your catching, be more aggressive with your drives, but don't settle and don't just stand up there waiting for a ball screen. Um, now when you have like we had Marlon Stewart a couple of years ago, well, late clock, we would do a lot of ball screen stuff with Marlon or we would give Marlon space. And, and he was such a good player that in such a high level IQ player that he could make the right play a lot of times. So I think, you know, different, different coaches have different late clock plays and that's the Terminator play. And, and uh -huh. so defensively, what's your Terminator defense? You know, are you weakened? Are you weak into a switch? Are you just switching? A lot of flat ball screens are hard to just, you know, you, you, hard to just switch sometimes. You, you almost have to kind of force them one way to get a great switch on. And, and so, you know, there's different ways to guard those things. And I think it's being, it's important to be ready for what the, your opponent's terminators are. Love it. I love that terminology with it. And uh, I feel like I should should borrow this from you, the FIO, figure it out, because I say figure it out so much on offense. Yeah. But is that how you say it or do you say it file? Yeah. FIO, figure yeah. it out. Sometimes I'll say figure it out, but sometimes I'll just look at the guys and go, hey, man, FIO, FIO. I'll look at my kids and say FIO um, <laughs> because it is so much of what we do, whether it's coaching or whether it's being married or whether it's having a job, doing something else, you know, so much of this life is just FIO, just figure it out, mm -hmm. you know, fake it until you make it. My, my wife would say that as she was going from teaching to administration, you know, uh, and now she's not in education anymore, but like, I, I just think sometimes you gotta, you gotta give yourself a chance to figure it out, but you, you can't just rely on someone to do it for you. And, and defensive nowadays, like you can't script it. And, and there's just times where you've got to have some defensive instinct and figure it out and talk and communicate and, and do those kind of things. So, yeah, that's an old, I think I got that from coach Dosh, Tom Dosh, and, you know, you say figure it out all the time, but, but I think he used to put it up FIO. And uh, so I think I stole it from him when I was working with him at Northern state, he was the football coach there. So you come across a lot of different people uh, and, and you learn from a lot of different coaches at a lot of different sports. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and coaches hear me say it a lot about, uh, you know, structured to unstructured on offense, but as you just referenced, it's just as important on defense. We give them a structure because we're going to teach our system, but after that, they got to figure it out for yeah. sure. Well, and when you're going against your stuff every day, kids get used to it. They get comfortable with it and they can kind of figure that out. And then all of a sudden you're playing a team that runs a lot of different stuff that have a lot of different counters to it. So now it's a, it's a, it's a, it, now during a game, you, you, you know, they're, they're trying to figure it out and they're on the floor and they make the adjustments so much better than what we as coaches can make because they're out there and they can feel it better than we can. So when you got guys that can do that, I, that really, boy, the level of play that you can bring on a defensive side of it. You know, our best defensive teams weren't always just the best five athletes. A lot of times they were the best five guys that were tough, that could figure it out. And, and you know, you don't want to overcomplicate stuff, but a lot of times that's, that's just the way it is. Well, and I get that question a lot, especially when it comes to consulting is about, oh, you know, should we change our defense to get ready for an opponent? And then we're not playing our defense anymore or vice versa. Should we run different stuff on offense? And I always say, yes, you should. Absolutely. Because everything you're going to do is going to increase the IQ of your players and increase their perception action ability. So is, is that something you subscribe to in terms of not getting used to just playing against your defense, but getting used to playing against other coverages? Yeah, you know, we... Probably not enough. I, we, we probably stay. It's something I need to get better at. I know um, Coach Herps, Randall Herps, has joined our staff, and he's got some defensive ideas, I think, as far as that are a little bit outside the box for me that I think can help us with what you just said. It'll help us um, go against different things in offense, but it'll also give us some different things defensively, some different looks that we haven't had. But I like to think it's going to help us on offense go against it more in, in our in our day to day practice. And and, you know, I don't love zone. And, and, and so we're, we're never usually a team that practices a ton of zone. And, and but, you know, I, th I think those are areas that I can definitely improve. And and I got some staff, I think, around me right now that have some good ideas that kind of help our program improve that way. So, yeah, it's trying to be open minded and and and. 
at the end of the day, it's not about you as the head coach. It's, it's, it's just not, uh, it, it's about what can we do? How does, you know, what's our team? What's from an individual standpoint, how do we bring out the best to, to make our team our best? And, and sometimes, um, we can be stubborn. Um, and, but sometimes the answer is there. We just, we got to stop being so stubborn and maybe allow, maybe allow some different eyes and some different, uh, you know, some different ways of doing things to take place. And, and uh, I, I, that's an area where I know I can get better. Um, and, and really, there's a lot of areas, but that's an area that I know I can really improve at is, is being more open to more ideas on stuff. Just great knowledge and great terminology and everything that goes with it. So uh, thank you so much for sharing the game with us. Chris, I appreciate you having me. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun and I look forward to hearing more of your podcasts down the road.